Good afternoon, everyone, or uh, late morning, if you're on the West Coast. This is Tim Serantonio from NEON, and I'm very excited to be presenting today around every contact matters using your existing con contact database to grow your organization. Um, this is a fantastic session that we're going to be doing today with our friends at Constant Contact. Uh, before we get started, as usual, we're going to be going over some housekeeping items. Um, and, uh, and what I'll do is make sure that you can see my screen. So housekeeping item number one is that my screen should be shared now and everybody should be seeing that. Um, and, uh, and housekeeping item number two is that, yes, this is being recorded. So we will be recording today's session. Um, we have a few, Tim Antonio. I am Director of Business Development at Neon CRM, a nonprofit focused database company. And we're joined by Ryan Tartaglia and Matthew Montoya from Constant Contact. Ryan is the Associate Marketing Manager and Matthew is the Partner Enablement and Training Manager. So we have some awesome experts from the experts when it comes to email marketing. And so uh, Matt's gonna be taking on the majority of presentation today, but Ryan will be here to, to help answer any questions. Uh, we also have uh, uh, a member of the NEON team here to answer any questions on that side, uh, because um, you know, in terms of our general agenda today, what we're gonna be doing is going over um, content, contact best practices. We will be talking about the contact and Neon CRM integration a little bit. That's gonna be later on. So if you are uh, here for that, stick around um, a little bit later. Uh, but uh, even if you're not using Neon, even if you're not using Constant Contact, this is gonna be something that you're gonna get a lot, of, a lot out of. And we're really excited about that. Kind of the, the, the beauty of Neon's, uh, Neon One ecosystem is finding subject matter experts that can really help nonprofits like yourselves. So we're gonna drill down into the most important items when it comes to the value of your list. It's not just a bunch of emails. You gotta be able to actually put some love into it. And there's a lot that's changing in how email's being engaged. So we wanna talk about mobile. We wanna talk about building those emails to get results. You have only so many hours in the day and we want you to be effective with that. You know, instead of putting tons and tons of time, tons and tons of effort into something, sending it out and being disappointed with your click throughs and, and the conversions into donations, or, you know, it, if it doesn't happen, then the lack thereof, we want you to not be frustrated and nail this from the get go. And that goes all the way down to something like the subject line. And again, we will be recording this and we're gonna be sending this out. Um, also, just as another housekeeping item is that we uh, have some wonderful handouts Besides the slides from today, uh, Constant Contact has some amazing resources. We really love relying on those for how we're thinking about our own strategy when we're talking to our nonprofit clients. You know, we have 3,000 organizations. A lot of those people are using email. And so being able to rely on experts like Constant Contact is great, but then being able to quickly download a resource such as an ebook and a takeaway form, we've uploaded those for you. So feel free to download that as part of uh, uh, the go-to webinar interface here. That'll also be included when we do a follow-up as well. So, uh, Matt, uh, really excited to have you here. Before we start out, uh, is there anything that you want to tell the crowd about yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, you know, uh, I'll go ahead and speak to everybody about a little behind the scenes here, if, if that's all right, Tim. Yeah. Uh, when I met the, the team at Neon, I, I felt an immediate connection because of their passion for nonprofits. Uh, we found that we all have a particular passion for nonprofits, and my passion for nonprofits is because I worked for a nonprofit preceding my seven-year employment at Constant Contact. Worked at a 5013C for three and a half years, and that was bar none the hardest three and a half years I've ever worked in my career. Um, you know, bless you all for what you do. Uh, working long hours, often thankless positions, wearing multiple hats. Uh, I feel your pain. I felt your pain. And uh, I have a, a big place in my heart for nonprofits, and I'm excited to be talking to you all today. What, what was the nonprofit, Matt? It, it was the National Association 
Action for Community College Entrepreneurship, an education-based nonprofit that promoted entrepreneurship education at the community college level. Whoa. <laughs> and considering it's been seven years since I worked there, the fact that I was able to spew off that acronym so smoothly tells you how often I had to say it. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty intense um, in terms of, of the acronym. Nonprofits love their acronyms, though. <laughs> they do. Uh, I, I will say that. You know, here's a fun fact before we dive into to, in terms of, of just how much data people need to track. Um, my first email platform, can you take a guess what it was? Constant Contact. It was mine as well. I used Constant Contact. Well, I'm assuming Constant Contact, Tim. Uh, uh, I got to, uh, I found Constant Contact. I found Constant Contact because I uh, used Constant Contact at my nonprofit. We did some research, found Constant Contact is a great solution. I enjoyed working with the company as a consumer so much that I applied and have now been working there almost going into my eighth year. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the cool part is that Constant Contact has been around and, and has had a nonprofit focus for so long, even down to offering nonprofit special pricing, which is Absolutely. something we'll, we'll be pointing people to a little bit later on, too. Um, yeah, it was really cool. I worked for an art studio for adults with developmental disabilities, and we wanted to send out uh, updates. And I actually did an artist spotlight every month in the newsletter. And so I, I imagine we'll talk about content best practices and things like that. But I, I always found that new content uh, and exciting mission driven content was was the stuff that had the best open rates and click throughs. Well, the beautiful part about nonprofits is they're passionate. And if you if you carry your passion into your email, it's likely going to lead you to success. But we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit more later. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Um, so with that said, let's go ahead and get started, folks. Now, uh, first and foremost, we're going to start on the on kind of the, the specialty that NEON has, which is around nonprofit data specifically, because Constant Contact works with a lot of different types of organizations. You might have even seen co uh, commercials for Constant Contact where it's, you know, the dude and he's and he's trying to figure out like his woodworking shop and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But with NEON, we only work with nonprofits and associations. And so when it comes to data, Constant Contact knows that well, but NEON really specializes in it. So by, by starting with that foundation, it's going to make what Matt talks about even more powerful. So let's start there. So first and foremost, all of you track a lot of data. Now, you might not track all of the things here, but... Nonprofits typically are using at least five, as upwards of eight different data sources to understand who their constituents are. It can be donors, it can be members who are paying dues, people who came to an event, person who volunteered, someone who signed up for your constant contact newsletter, a person who visits your website, many, many more things. Uh, if you are a animal humane society, people who would adopt from you. If you're a social work focused organization, maybe people who are applying for your services, all of these different personas, all of these different types of people, so to speak, can and should represent data. I mean, it is data. Uh, you know, one of the jobs that I got before uh, working at Neon was for a Catholic school. And the thing that I think helped me get the job was when I said in the interview that a database is simply a technological um, representation of relationships and people. That's it. And those pieces of data need to tell a story. And so all of you track a lot of different data. And the reality is, is that better the better data that you have on someone, the better the relationship. And I always tell this story. Uh, when I was living in Chicago, we adopted two cats. Um, and, and it was from a shelter that we absolutely loved and we would, would love the imagery. I mean, cats, right? Like cats and kids, they're kind of like really high up there on things that, that get people to go awe and do something when it comes to a, a call to action. Right. But I adopted and then any subsequent follow-up, they never referenced the fact that I had a relationship with them. I was always treated as a potential donor. And I and and to me, I had invested in their organization through the form of adoption. And I would have gladly given them money if they had referenced my relationship with them. And so when when all of you look at your lists 
uh, that big email blast list that we're going to talk about a little bit later on uh, in detail, uh, or or your donor list, or your your annual report when you're running that. Even if you're doing is something as simple as segmenting people into, well, these are our zero uh, in kind gifts to the hundred dollar gifts. These are the hundred and to 250 gifts all the way up to your major donors, you're still thinking about people in a way that they have a relationship with you. So the less flat your understanding of who someone is, the better capability you have to retain them long-term. Because good data gives you the keys you need to engage supporters effectively and build real sustainable relationships. Now, it's also cost effective to maintain these types of contacts. It's actually going to cost your organization five times more money to successfully cultivate a new donor than it is to keep an existing contact at your organization. Uh, this is a great source from Nonprofit Quarterly, who you may remember we did a uh, webinar on data recently with. And uh, they're experts at, when it comes to this type of stuff. Stuff because they're always talking to executive directors, they're always talking to database folks, and really trying to understand uh, what it goes into actually managing a nonprofit. And, and that's a big number. That's something that should concern everyone, but it also is something that should energize your organization as well. Because if we don't think about it as the expense side, if we think about it as creating and keeping existing contacts, we're gonna see that it's easier to engage people that you already have an existing relationship with than it is to try to get somebody new. We hear a lot about donor retention, and this is why donor retention matters, because it costs you money when you don't retain somebody. So we want to be able to really empower you as an organization to think about relationships as the reason you even have a database. And it could just be constant contact. It could just be an Excel spreadsheet. It doesn't matter. You might not be using something sophisticated like Neon yet. That's okay. You should still be thinking about this in terms of relationship building. And for us, that's a reason that we actually uh, wanted to work together when it comes to uh, constant contact and, and neon CRM um, because we want to be able to have all this data seamlessly connect. Um, and, and actually, Matt, I'm mm -hmm. blanking a little bit. Is now the integration talk or should I do that later? <laughs> That's going to be a little bit later. That's what I thought. But it still stands to reason why we built this connection because it's going to help us really kind of Look, time is money, and you spending time importing and exporting lists is going to be a pain in the butt. So easy access to all that data is something that we at both Constant Contact and Neon prioritize. And it isn't just contact information. It's events. It's volunteers. It's truly understanding everything as it relates to your organization. So that's why we think data is really cool and really important because it builds relationships and saves you money. Now, when it comes to the wacky, complicated world of email marketing, though, we have to hand it to Constant Contact when it comes to not only the logistics of me literally handing it to Matt, which is what I'm going to do right now, but also subject matter experts. So Matt, I'm gonna hand this over to you as a Great. presenter. So we're gonna transition over to the team at Constant Contact for their side, which is gonna drill into all such amazing, folks, if you haven't cheated and looked at the handout already in terms of the slide deck, this is gonna be a wild ride. So uh, really excited, Matt, why don't you take it away? All right, Tim. Uh, so I'm crazy excited to talk to you guys. I already said that earlier. I'm going to share a lot of information, probably too much information, honestly. That's why we're recording it. That's why we have handouts. But when I met with Tim and, and the folks at Neon, you know, they're really passionate about nonprofits and they really want you to get a lot of information. Uh, and so I've packed this deck with a lot of information. Now, do you know, before I really kind of get into the core here, um, I am keeping this pretty agnostic when it comes to email solutions. Uh, I know some of you may not use Constant Contact. Some of you may not want to use it in the future. That's okay. You can use the tips I'm going to share with you uh, today 
on any platform for the most part. There's going to be a few things I talk that are specific about Constant Contact, but only because that's who I work for and that's the product I know. Uh, but whether you use Constant Contact or not, uh, you should get a lot of value out of what I'm, I'm going to share with you today. Um, secondly, the uh, uh, we do have a great integration with Neon, and so if you're considering using email marketing, then hopefully I make a pretty good case for you today. But regardless, let's start with the most important thing. You know, the title of this presentation is Every Contact Matters. Every contact matters. Everybody who's donated to you, everybody that's attended your events, everybody who's given you a gift, everybody who's volunteered matters. And you can actually quantify the value of that list by doing some simple math. I encourage all of you, you don't have to do it now, you can do it later. You can do it now if you're quick at math. Is calculate and always be aware of how valuable your list is because it's probably the most important asset your organization has besides the talented people working with you. You quantify your list by multiplying the size of your list, and that can be in Neon CRM, or that can be in, um, that can be in uh, another tool. It can be in Excel. Just write down the size of your list and multiply that by the average donation you get or the average gift you get or the average registration price point of that your business model, whatever it is that you generally receive from folks. Multiply that together and you'll have quantified your list. And for many of you, that, that number is going to be in the millions of dollars. And what I've learned in, in talking to over 10,000 nonprofits in my time at Constant Contact is not enough really respect how valuable that list is. And I know that they don't uh, respect it because they're not doing email marketing. They're not doing outreach. They're just collecting these contacts. And they're not doing anything with it. And, you know, Tim talked earlier about how important data is. Data is everything, and every single time somebody gives you a contact, they're telling you the, their contact information, they're telling you something, and every single time you send out some email marketing, they're telling you something, and every single time they go to your website, they're telling you something, you've got to listen to it because you can grow your organization by listening to that information. But let's kind of pull it back a little bit and think about why these lists are so valuable. Why does each contact matter? because they've met you. They've been to your site, they've called you, they've attended your events, they've donated to you. These people already know about your passion and may have already contributed to you. These are not cold calling prospects. These are people that have shown a, 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 a interest in you or have actually already contributed to you. They've already taken action with you. You have to treat these contacts with respect because they potentially can give you more donations, give you another gift, volunteer again, or donate for the first time. I have to respect the value of our list before we take any further action because if we pay attention to best practices and we utilize tools to help us be successful, then we will be successful. But if we ignore best practices, if we don't utilize tools to help us be successful, odds are we're not going to see the full value come out of that list. Now, to pull the full value out of your list, when it comes to email marketing, obviously that's my bread and butter. Email marketing must be relevant to the audience, first and foremost. Gone are the days when we could send out an email with a laundry list, a kitchen sink worth of information. When I was working at that nonprofit, gosh, now going back to 2010, um, uh, we used to send out a weekly bulletin with 50 different things in it. Can't do that anymore. Why? Because the idea of sending a lot of different things to a bit different people isn't as effective as sending a unique message to as unique an audience as possible. Now, what we're talking about here is a concept called segmentation. Taking a look at your contacts, taking a look at your data, and breaking up a person by uh, particular groups and, and categorization. That could be income. That could be previous interaction they've had with you. So did they donate? Did they attend? Did they volunteer? It could be their location. For some of you that have location-based events or maybe your nonprofit is about a particular location, well, location could matter. It could be their gender. Certainly some of you work with different gender-specific content. Well, that could matter. Their education level, the impact your organization has had on their lives or the lives of people they love, that could matter. The more you know about your contacts, the more you can make better and more strategic marketing decisions to help you pull more donations, gifts, attendance, or whatever you're trying to do out of those the, uh, contacts you have. Now, one great thing about email marketing, if you haven't jumped in with email marketing, whether you use Constant Contact or any other tool, is that you can actually use links to learn from people. Every single click, and I'm seeing some comments on the audio stream. Are you guys hearing any dropouts on your side, Tim? 
I am not actually yeah. everything. You know, All right, so I, I'm I'm hearing <laughs> things fine. Um, now I will say that uh, sometimes that relates to whether you're on the phone mm -hmm. or the computer. Um, so potentially try switching over to the other option that are that supplied. So. I would say that too, folks. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking through the internet and occasional dropouts are going to happen. I uh, just wanted to make sure it wasn't widespread. Every single contact that clicks on a link tells you something. So I want you in your mind's eye to envision an email from your organization, whether you've sent out email before or not, doesn't really matter. I want you in your mind's eye to envision that. You have different links for different events. You have different links for different pieces of news or different kinds of operations you're working on. By clicking on one of those links, that person just told you something about themselves. A tool like Constant Contact tells you who clicked on what link. A tool like Constant Contact can actually take that contact and put it into a brand new list for you and even automatically send a follow-up about that contact information. If data is everything, then knowing what people clicked on is critical. And Tim, you brought up something about uh, donation history. You want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah, I, you know, donor donor information is is pretty key when trying to understand the relationships that you have with someone. Being able to create segmentations around giving history uh, is a first step toward an extremely sophisticated segmentation plan overall for both email, physical mail, and any, any t other type of engagement. But email is one of the easiest ways that you can start um, because is it's the most cost effective when it comes to what you can do, right? Like you pay for a subscription, a constant contact, and you know, that's pretty inexpensive versus, you know, doing a mailing to 5,000 people that you're not sure what the return is going to be on. So if you can really nail it out of the gate with a solid donor uh, focus list, then, you know, it's awesome. And so uh, creating lists around giving levels is a nice start, mm -hmm. but, um, kind of to, to go from 101 to 201 all the way up to our four and 500 level class, so to speak. Um, the more sophisticated elements that you can take into account are previous campaigns, total giving history, reference to dates, like when they last gave, that's always a, a good one that you can leverage. Um, and uh, and then giving interests. So let's say you have multiple programs that you're operating at your nonprofit then if they gave to a specific thing and you have a note that actually references that uh, or you can use data to actually segment by that because um, typically notes are going to be a little dicey <laughs> so go to like standard data points like if you're using neon a campaign a fund a purpose to help organize that type of stuff and that makes it's easy. And so if it's like these people gave because they they were asked to be part of a challenge grant and the challenge grant succeeded and that challenge grant was helping fund uh, the purchase of some new equipment for the community kitchen, like send, make a list about those people if it was significant enough and do a video in your email <laughs> that you link to about the community kitchen, like that type of stuff where you tie the message to what they gave because it's like you're reporting back and that feedback loop helps actually keep people. So that's how it relates to giving in my opinion. Well, and you know, what's really nice too about a tool like Constant Contact is you can actually personalize the subject line to refer to that particular campaign that they contributed to or you, and or you could actually personalize the content to specifically talk about that by doing nothing more than almost like a mail merge in constant contact it's pretty cool but uh you know i want to challenge everybody when i talk about the importance of having an email be relevant to the audience given all the nonprofits that i've met do you want to guess what the number one way people make email irrelevant is today and i can tell you it's probably not what you're thinking but the answer is on the slide if we look at this uh, model here, that's the answer. Not creating emails that are built for today's reading habits. You know, I, told, I brought up a story earlier about me back at the nonprofit, and we'd have this long, uh, kitchen sink email with five different programs and three different asks and a campaign or two that we were trying to uh, grow revenue for. And uh, you can't do that anymore, pr primarily because of mobile readership. But I'd like everybody to do is make sure you look at your screen. I'm going to run a test with you. I want you to imagine, obviously, if this was in person, I could ask you. But I want you to figure out what's wrong with this email I'm about to show you. Oh. <laughs> Let me try that again. 
I actually have to show you the email. All right, now time's up. Now, first of all, I gave you five seconds to do that. And that's the first critical thing to learn here is the average email subscriber on a PC, Mac, or tablet spins about uh, 15 to 30 seconds with an email. That's not a lot of time. But on a mobile device, that becomes five seconds. The average subscriber spends about five seconds in an email. And when we take a look at this email, and I've already seen some folks respond, yeah, absolutely, the, the event was not prominent. There's a slew of issues with this email. First and foremost, it's way too much content. It is, it's overwhelming people. Even if they gave it 30 seconds worth of time, probably wouldn't be able to dig into the content. On top of that, it's not apparently obvious what the most important thing is. Maybe it's that article on the top, but maybe it's something on the side. So there's a slew of issues with this, but first and foremost, it's the way that it would look on a mobile device. Here's how that email would look on a mobile device, either full size or rendered to fit the screen, but you can see the problem on the left, full size, I would have to slide that email back and forth on my mobile device. And the fact is most people are not going to do that. They're not going to spend the time to scroll side to side. Or the email on the right where it's too small to read, they're going to have to pinch to read it. Well, there's two problems with that. One, they're probably not going to pinch to read it. Unfortunately, people are lazy. And two, uh, if they pinch to read it, they're not going to see all of the content. So why, why do I keep harping about this mobile, 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 mobile? Well, here's why. On average, 51% of email subscribers open their email on a mobile device. So let's go back to that concept of you, every contact matters. Let's go back to that concept that your list has value because these people have met you, they've donated, they've attended your events, they met, met you at, at trade shows or things like that, right? If our email does not look good on mobile, then we're not reaching the audience. We're not getting the donations we deserve. We are not getting the attendance we deserve because they're ignoring our email. When an email doesn't look good on mobile, well, we problems are pretty big. 80% will just outright delete it. They'll just outrightly delete it. And unfortunately, what we're doing is we're training them not to open up future emails. 30% will just unsubscribe to it. So here's somebody who has donated in the past. Here's somebody that met you at a show. Here's somebody who registered for an event, maybe even volunteered, just outright unsubscribing. We're taking the value that that person brought to our organization, we're basically casting it away. And you can't keep doing that. So first of foremost, the biggest problems with that email, again, wasn't made for mobile, had way too much content. It had multiple columns. So whatever tool, if you're currently doing email marketing, make sure you're not using multiple columns. Great for 10 years ago. Problem with multiple columns, and what I mean by that is if you want to imagine almost like a newspaper, you have a little column on the left and a big column on the right. People have to pinch to read that kind of content, and they're not going to do that. The biggest sin of that email is it had way too many choices. So here's some best practices. 25 lines of text or less. Keep it short. Keep it succinct. Drive people to your website, to your blog, to social media, to a video to learn more. The email is not the message. for the message try learning of that's going to be pretty to scroll to see the most can choose enough that's where the data that helps us make better marketing decisions come from and keep it one column only. but they're going to get a better return on their investment because that information is going to be relevant to that particular audience. Those decisions this organization made become more evident when we look at it on a mobile. The original email on the left and the email with less content on the right, we can see that it's already looking a little better. Not quite there yet, but they're getting there. My next tip, next, next best practice is to take color seriously when you're doing email marketing. Color really matters. We look at this email on the left. <laughs> A train wreck of an email. A couple of problems with the email on the I'll be finding more than that. It's, it's the eye is overwhelmed. The eye doesn't know where to look. There's way too many things calling for our attention. Look at the email on the right. Same organization. They're using color to their advantage. Now we know that we're supposed to, we're supposed to book now. On top of that, the brand, which was blue and yellow, nowhere to be found on the email on the left. You can see that blue and yellow thoughtfully brought into the email. The email on the left, it's hard to read. 
those color choices make the content hard to read the email on the right using color to their advantage. One nice thing about a tool like Constant Contact is you can actually brand your email by just putting in your URL and Constant Contact will automatically match your brand colors to your email and even bring in your logo and social media links. So the email on the left, uh, color wasn't that bad, but they did make it hard to read with that gray area and the color wasn't as tight as it could be on the right. They made it easier to read. They're using color to their advantage and they're bringing in their brand. Now I keep bringing up brand, brand, brand. I'm sure all of you would probably have a logo in your email. So why does the brand colors matter? Because it represents 80% of brand recognition. Obviously you're working in your office, you're, you're working in your space every single day. You know uh, uh, how passionate you are, but somebody who volunteered a couple of years ago, somebody who donated a couple of years ago, they may not immediately be thinking of you top of mind. Well, that color scheme will represent, remind them of your brand up to 80%. So it's really important to brand your emails to your organization's brands and stick to it over and over and over again. Don't change just to celebrate holidays or special events. Stick to your brand colors. Use images in your email marketing. Use images in your email marketing. 82% of subscribers pay more attention to email that have images. Make sure you use them. Use three or fewer images to get the highest response rate. And make sure you never use images as your content, meaning never create a flyer, save it as an image and make the entire email an image. You wanna watch out for that. There's a hidden danger when you do that, but I'll share that with you in just a second. So some best practice, some things to avoid. Avoid really large images. Really large images require people to scroll back and forth. Again, avoid an all image email and don't use images that are so big that it pushes your content down much like this email we see on the right. Do make your images fit the, the screen. Use images to tell your story. Image speaks a thousand words, let your image do that. Make sure you choose an appropriate image that tells a story for you. Keep your image account down to three images or less, not including your logo. Make sure you always link your images back to a pertinent page. Images get some of the highest click-throughs of anything you'll ever put in an email. So if you have an event or you have a donation uh, campaign going on, if you include an image related to that campaign, more people will click on that image than a little blue hyperlink. And use buttons. So let's go down that rabbit hole. So many nonprofits I've met use blue hyperlinks. Nothing terribly wrong with that, except it's a little outdated. What you wanna do is use buttons to drive people to go to your site, to your blog, to your social media, to your videos. Buttons are these yellow buttons. You, you see the yellow, re yellow rectangles throughout this email. Buttons get a very high click-through rate. On top of that, they're buttons and people know they're supposed to click buttons. Buttons can be uh, uh, linked to anything anywhere. And in tools like Constant Contact, you can not only link it to the website, you can link it to a blog, you can link, I'm sorry, you can link it to a PDF, you can even link it to an email so someone in your contact and your organization can be contacted. But I wanna call attention to what else you see on the screen there. You see those white squares with the red X's? That's called image blocking. Image blocking happens about 30 to 40% of the time. So I want to call back to what I mentioned a little bit earlier. Never let your email marketing be all image. If your email is all image and the image gets blocked, you're sending people nothing. We're uh, relinquishing value out of our list. If you notice, the buttons don't disappear, though. That's the number one reason to use buttons. It's because they're big, they're easy to click on, and they never disappear. Blue hyperlinks, people have to pinch to click on, and we've learned earlier people don't like to do that. So the email on the left, they were using a lot of hyperlinks. They were giving people too many choices, too many image choices, too many things to click on. The email on the right, they decided to keep their click-through uh, options down to three. They're going to get a higher response rate because this is speaking specifically to that particular audience they're sending this email to, and they're giving people fewer choices, but they're strategically thinking about the choices they're going to give them. My next tip. Use a mobile responsive email tool. And this is the most important thing I'll share with you today. Whether you use Constant Contact or not, make sure whatever tool you're using is mobile responsive. What that means is the email will redesign itself based on the device it lands on. Email on the left is for Mac, PC, tablet. The organization that made this email only made one email. The email on the right automatically redesigned itself to be optimized for the mobile experience, meaning that Fonts get larger, the buttons get easier to click on, and things stack on top of each other. So let's do an overview here. Always make sure to choose the right template. Don't use multiple columns. Try to use a one column template. Keep your key call to action high up in your email. Make sure to use your brand colors every single time. Don't forget social media. Always include social media. That way you can drive people to 
speak on your behalf and, and spread the good news about your organization. Make sure your logo is rightfully sized. Don't make it so large that it buries your contact down. Make sure you use a mobile responsive template, no matter what tool you use. Communicate through pictures, but don't have any more than three images. And 20 lines of text or less gets the highest response rate, so try to keep your content succinct. If you have more to say than 20 lines of text, say it on your website, force them to click. Remember, when they click on a link, a tool like Constant Contact will track that behavior, and you'll learn more about your subscribers. Now, up at the top, we have to write a compelling subject line to get the email open, right? Everything I've shared with you up to now is for not if you don't write a great subject line. So let's talk about getting your email actually opened. First of all, your organization's name is probably the key to getting your email open. For most, especially nonprofits, it's the from name that gets noticed first. And if you're sending an email from a staffer, well, people may not know that staffer. Even if you're an executive director or a CEO, people may know you really well, but what happens if you leave, right? If people are opening the email because the email comes from you and you happen to leave, well, then your open rate's going to decrease. So the best practice for nonprofits is to have an email come from your organization. The from name is the number one reason an email gets open. We can see an example of the from name right here at the top, Matco Foundation. Most people are going to pay attention to that and then maybe read the subject line. The next most important part of a subject line is something called pre-header text. And that's a little bit of text, usually the first sentence of an email. If you think about your own inbox, your own phone's inbox, you're probably reading that first sentence to decide whether the email is important or not. A tool like Constant Contact actually allows you to craft that text outside of your email and use it as bait. The next most important part of getting your email opened is the subject line. So let's talk about how all three pieces work together. My first tip as far as writing a compelling subject line is to avoid repeats. This is unfortunately something I see a lot of nonprofits do. They'll repeat the same subject line week after week, month after month. The problem is we're giving people no incentive to open the email. It can very easily be tuned out. Next tip is to keep it short. Be brief, about five to eight words. Brevity is really important in the subject line because most subject lines past eight words will get cut off and if you can't make your case to why they'll want to open the email in eight words, then your subject line is probably too complex. Try to use the words you are your in as many subject lines as you can. When you make a subject line, you are your, you put the ownership now upon the subscriber. You put the ownership on the reader. Now it is their problem. It's their solution. It's their community. It's their opportunity. Write a subject line as a question. Now, I'm giving you a lot of different ideas. You don't have to do all of these. Choose one you like. Even better, test out your subject line ideas, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that in a second. Questions are a fantastic subject line because they cause curiosity. Can you do more to help? Notice we're using that word, you. Notice that the name of the organization is listed, not my name, not a staffer's name, not the executive director's name. That's because that's more familiar to the audience. And here, they're using preheader text. Christmas is almost upon us. So many are needing. Now, they did something really crafty here. They didn't finish the sentence. They're forcing people to open the email to find out what people are needing. Struggling to find a way to help? With recent events affecting our community, many need, many need what? They have to open the email. To... Alliteration is repeating the same letter for every single word of your subject line. The human eye seeks patterns. When we're in a hurry and we're met with a lot of data, pattern recognition is something we instinctively rely on to make sense of chaos. If you think about an inbox, that's a lot of information people are accessing really quickly. So by repeating the same letter for every word, we're giving them a pattern and we're getting them to slow down. Seven simple solutions save season. Friday fun for families and fellowship. Today's top terrific tips. On top of that, they're utilizing that preheader text. We've got what you need this season. We are ready to, you notice how they're baiting people to open the email? Very clever. Illusion. Illusion is one of my favorite subject line ideas. Illusion is alluding to something pop culture, right? So a famous uh, song title, a famous uh, song lyric, a famous movie title, a famous biblical quote, political quote. As long as you believe your audience would understand it, it can equal a lot of opens because it's familiar. What we're trying to get people to do is slow down and pay attention to our subject line. Let it go, let it go. Well, that's the familiar uh, uh, line from the movie Frozen. 
you have kids under the age of 12, you've probably just got that song stuck in your head now, and I'm sorry. Drop off those extra clothes today. More than ever, people need... See how they're using that pre-header text? Let them eat cake and brownies. May the farce be with you. Familiar lines to slow people down. Most importantly, no matter what tool you use, make sure you test your assumptions. If you're going to undertake email marketing or if you're currently undertaking email marketing, never rely on just the best practices you learn in a webinar like this. Never rely on your own instincts or the instincts of people that worked in the organization before you. Don't rely on what the board says is the best practice. Test and test constantly. Constant contact when it comes to subject lines gives you the ability to test your assumptions. In this example, you can actually put in two different subject lines. You can decide how much of your audience will receive which subject line, and you can decide how long the test will run. So in this case, 10% of the list will get this subject line, 10% of the list will get this subject line, 48 a That means for actually sending the best subject line gift that is power. a quick introduction in terms of how the integration works with Constant Contact. Um, now, uh, this is cool because while Neon has its own internal communications tool, um, you know, and we've worked with MailChimp for a while, Constant Contact's special. Constant Contact's special for a lot of different reasons, but one of the most special components is how you actually even connect to it in Neon. So first and foremost, uh, what I actually did, and, and uh, Matt, uh, just before I forget, thank you for putting Frozen into my head. Uh, <laughs> You're very welcome. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I have to suffer, you have to suffer. I have two daughters, nine and, uh, nine and 12, so you I, I actually have gotten around my daughter, who's three, like being obsessed with that. She's a little bit more into Moana, which I'm actually pretty cool with. That's, that's actually pretty good music in that one. It's pretty great music in that <laughs> Anyway, I every died. parent is laughing in every non-parent or, <laughs> or like, empty nesters. Go up and show me the integration. So, <laughs> so constant contact. If you go into your Neon system, this should be enabled uh, as part of the celebration of our launch and partnership with the folks at Constant Contact. Uh, we wanted to give everybody the chance to make a quick connection to either test it out or if you're currently using Constant Contact to quickly engage your existing account. Now, this doesn't cost a dime to, to do. So if you're interested in even trying out constant contact go into your neon system go down to constant contact and you can connect your account and so if you don't have one it's going to prompt you to be able to create one but i actually do have a constant contact account and all you have to do is click connect constant contact it'll open up a thing asking you to sign in if you don't have an account sign up through here if you do log in It'll ask you, do you want to allow access to constant contact? Yes. Boom, you're done. That's it. That's all you have to do. It'll, it'll connect it to one primary constant contact account. If your organization is using multiple constant contact accounts, I'm wondering why. Um, <laughs> I imagine, Matt, you might wonder why too. Um, but, uh, you know, in this case, it's going to do it to the one. I can see use cases for potentially multiple, but uh, you know, typically we're gonna do the one-to-one -one because that's what most organizations have. So that's all you gotta do. Now, if you, for some reason, did the wrong account, maybe you have one for like a side hustle that you're doing, and I can't believe I use the term side hustle, but <laughs> here we go. Um, if you wanna disconnect, all you have to do is go to system settings if you have permission controls and click constant contact down here and disconnect. And that's all you have to do. That's it. Now, using it 
this is the other part that makes it special is that we are bi-directional with Constant Contact. None of our other email systems uh, or, or other integrations for email have this. So this is pretty cool because what you'd be able to do is, is actually import people from Constant Contact. You can import contacts and you know it's a simple thing that you can either say, look, I want to import. You can see a report that's been done maybe i just click you know this and it's going to import uh, contacts from constant contact and it's going to tell me when it's done and same for pushing the constant contact you can actually take people from within neon and push it to an existing constant contact list so we're going to let that work in the background a little bit what you can do is a uh, really good start is this getting started link I think that's a pretty good place to to begin things. And so it's saying, you know, how do I actually send an email to people from my neon system? Well, you've got to create a list and uh, it's going to be able to give some information on that. Or you can go to lists, lists and do that. Or you can create it in constant contact, too. And so if you're trying to understand what things are, there's a little help icon for these you can also get in here and say you know i want to uh make this active or hidden or something of that nature hey look my list has been imported from constant contact i can even click there and view the result so you're going to be able to work with a neon for all the list management which is great now uh once you actually do that it can actually uh click into the list and show you all the folks and what's nice about this is that i'm actually going to click this and it's going to open up and you can see that this is an actual person that came in from constant contact so it's actually noting where they came from so even when you go to the record you know oh this is someone who maybe signed up for my newsletter and i wanted to bring them in because it was maybe my planned giving subscription right like that's something that you want to cultivate those people maybe you don't want to bring in every list which is why we allow you to segment and say which lists you can actually bring in, um, you know, actually sync when you do that type of stuff, which is pretty nifty. Uh, you can also get some stats. Now, we haven't actually sent anything from this because I literally just connected it. But even more cool when it comes to statistics is the fact that we have built a dedicated widget. So I know I'm jumping around to a few different places. Mainly you can live in this constant contact bar over here, but you're gonna be able to actually move uh, and engage constant contact data in a few different places in Neon. And one of those is the fact that we built our own dedicated widget. So if I had some campaigns that I had actually sent, scheduled through constant contact, built through constant contact, it's gonna bring that data back into the database and I'd be able to see it on a campaign level and on an individual's account. So there's some other nifty things um, that uh, that when it comes to the basic settings that I think also helps this stand out. And this is one of the ones that we got a lot of feedback and we, we spent a lot of time researching uh, based off of previous experiences. And that was the unsubscribes. So when you do your settings, this is the most important thing to also look at besides what lists you're engaging, which is around how you're gonna handle unsubscribes. And check this out, you got ability to actually handle it on both sides. So you can say, when someone unsubscribes in constant contact, do you want that person to be opted out of email in Neon? Because sometimes people use Neon, and I've seen this a lot. Uh, I work with a lot of organizations here in, in Schenectady, New York, for instance, where they use uh, constant contact as their newsletters, as the things that are like visually very beautiful. And then they use Neon for kind of the down and dirty appeals process where it's like you're going to have, have, you know, a bunch of access, quick access to data uh, around their giving history that you wouldn't necessarily want to, ne to have to rely on or put in constant contact for everything. And so when you're doing appeals through Neon, maybe you don't want to opt those people out if they happen to not want your newsletter anymore. That's fine. And same with resubscribes, you'd be able to opt them back in. Same uh, uh, when it comes to opt outs in Neon. Do you want that person who's opted out of maybe the appeals that you've done through Neon to be also opted out through uh, the every single constant contact email list? Uh, but 
constant contact has multiple lists. So maybe you don't want to do that. And, and, you know, we have some recommended versus not recommended things. You can ignore the, the recommended setting and go to the not recommended. Just there's a reason we put that <laughs> because we talked to the folks at constant contact and said, what do you want to do? And same with uh, importing. Uh, and pushing, there's actually going to be settings that you can engage around duplications. So matching things up. Um, if there's multiple people that we find in Neon, what are we going to do? We don't want to match it. We want to create a new record. Don't import the person. You know, maybe we want to import from specific lists. As I was mentioning before, you know, maybe we never do our general interest list, but uh, or my test list rather. But I do want to do constantly contact acting in my general interest, though, that type of stuff. So you have a lot of control. That's what I love about this. And it also leads down into custom fields. So constant contact allows up to uh, actually check it 15, 15 custom fields that you can sync over uh, uh, basic account information that goes beyond the basics that we always send over. We're, we're, we're going to send over their name. We're going to send over their email, obviously. But if you wanted to send over, you know, are they a specific type of person if you're using individual type or account custom fields? Uh, maybe you track uh, a bunch of different information, check boxes, drop downs, radio buttons, all that type of stuff. That, that data can get pushed over to constant contact, which is cool. And so the actual engagement and building of things in is done in constant contact so what's cool is that i could just click from neon be brought back into my account i don't have to actually log in again i can log in to constant contact from uh uh from neon crm which is awesome and then when i send this information out again that information uh is going to be brought back into both the person's record uh, and it's going to be brought back into the constant contact stats area as well. So that's just a high level overview of the integration. Maybe we can get into some Q and A. Uh, oops, not I, I had it set correctly. Uh, the Q and A uh, uh, section. And if you are interested, you know uh, we have a link that we can start sending out if you want to uh, check out more information from Constant Contact. Uh, we can link to the guide if you want. And of course, you can also go to neon.constantcontact.com and, and check that out too. But folks, as a partner, as, as you know, part of the um, I know that there might be some question. Uh, and while you're looking up the questions, Tim, I do want to just talk a little bit about why Constant Contact is different than maybe some of the other companies people yeah. have used. Um, and it's what attracted me when I worked at a nonprofit to Constant Contact. Um, you know, it's it's Constant Contact believes in education first. Uh, I, you know, I, I'll frame it in the brief time I had in front of you today. Um, very unlikely that any other company you might use to do email marketing is going to spend time to have a live employee speak to you and talk to you about this stuff that's so important. Like, I'd be willing to bet many of you learned at least one or two things today that you didn't know before that would actually impact your bottom line. Um, organizations that uh, that you may have used in the past, pro products you might use now, um, education isn't their focus. Uh, they'll put some blog articles out there. They might have an occasional video. Constant Contact does weekly, bi-weekly trainings uh, helping people get started. I literally came off a webinar seconds before getting on this webinar. Uh, we do stuff in person. We have experts out there in the field to help you. Um, it's it's uh, an education first company because this is too important to not be fully educated on. And um, the, the amount of education we have available is pretty, pretty big. All right, so we do have some questions. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, I don't know, how about we, I got some technical stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe we do kind of this first best practice one that I saw and a few other um, constant contact specific ones, and then we can swing back to um, the uh, integration questions. We'll definitely sure. get to both. Uh, so uh, one, we did have a comment that uh, affecting is not the same as affecting by the way. So, yeah. I, I just wanted to point that out. So. Well, you know, I'm laughing because I have a to-do list on my uh, on my desk right now that says fix that. And so 
Uh, <laughs> sorry. No, that's okay. That's uh, that's all good. It's uh, you know, uh, it got the desired effect. Um, I, I I could lie and say I did that on purpose to make sure you're paying attention. I could ooh, that. ooh, that, I forgot that was our hidden that was our hidden uh, congratulations our attention thing. Congratulations, Sonia. You you nailed it. You got it. You found it. Um, we're gonna hook you up with a free constant contact trial. Just go to neon.contact.com. <laughs> Um, so, okay, here's, here's a, a content one, regardless of, uh, of, of what platform you're using. And I think this is a good one. Do you recommend still doing monthly e-newsletters with multiple stories that link to your website, or is it better to send out each individual, uh, like individual emails about each story? Generally, the best practice is actually to send it out for each story. I mean, this is going to go back to the theory I led with, which is, you know, you really want to know your audience. You want to make sure that that piece of content is going to be as relevant as possible to that audience. Obviously, you're never going to get 100 percent there. Um, but, you know, the idea here is less is more. Um, if, if you have three different things you could be speaking about this month, but those are three disparate things that may not be of interest to 100% of your audience, then it's probably better to do shorter, more simple emails about individual topics sent to a specific group. Um, you know, uh, what uh, this person was talking about is very, very common in the nonprofit world of, of having, you know, that monthly newsletter uh, philosophy, um, which is going away. Um, it, it's, it's certainly transitioning out of that one size fits all almost print like newsletter uh, mentality. Um, you want to take a look at your, get to know your contacts really well, use Neon Serum uh, to learn more about your subscribers and then make decisions based on what you've learned about those people to give them information that's gonna be pertinent to them. And uh, what happens if you don't have anywhere near a thousand records to test a subject line? It just means the test isn't as robust as it can be. You can actually do the test with two people, but obviously the uh, variables aren't enough there for you to know that the test is valid. So if you're running it with, let's say, 250 contacts, the test will still run. It'll still go in that particular case, uh, you know, 20% to one group, 20% to the other, uh, the remaining get the, 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 the winner. It just means that the variables will skew the results a little bit. Um, we always suggest a thousand so that you get a better Percentage-wise, you get a better uh, result for the test, but you don't have to do a thousand. It'll do it with any number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So now I think we're going to get into kind of a mishmash of of bull. Oh, actually, here's another constant contact one. Is it possible to add first name in the subject line with constant contact? Yeah, you can actually add first name, first and last name, last name, or any contact information you've collected. So as Tim was showing you the integration, um, you know, he showed a lot of very specific categories. You can actually say anything in the subject line. First name, though, does increase open rates significantly. Um, and it's definitely one of the things that not only we have available that will teach you how to do um, if, if you're a kind of a novice with this kind of stuff. So uh, somebody was asking, how do I export my email distribution lists uh, from Neon into Constant Contact? Okay, so this is this is a little bit in terms of um, uh, kind of not inside baseball, but something that some people might not know about Neon uh, as a capability is that we have what's called a distribution list, which, which is literally just a first name, a last name, and an email that uh, doesn't count when we're doing pricing. It's just a list that you blast. It's kind of like what you would count as a general newsletter list. If you want to download that, you can go to the distribution list and there should be an area that you can export that. Um, so that would just be, it doesn't connect to the, the, um, the sync as we've programmed it because what the, the point of the sync and the point of the connection um, is to help automate larger amounts of more sophisticated data. Right. Like kind of the theory is that if you're using constant contact, that uh, that's kind of already handling your base distribution data anyway, that neon is typically going to hold on to more sophisticated data. Let's say you've never used constant contact before or you just happen to have uh, a distribution list that's easy to download and upload into constant contact. Just don't use the sync. The sync is for uh, people with an account ID. 
Um, same goes with in terms of the uh, the plugin with Neon for our Neon on newsletter sign up form. Separate thing. The sign up uh, thing for Neon is a distribution list tied item. This was just kind of our attempt to give some functionality that like is a pale imitation in all honesty of constant contact stuff. So it definitely works. It definitely does the job. But Neon uh, constant contact has its own widgets, has its own plugins. Um, so you'd be able to actually have it tie with uh, a list in constant contact and then sync those up to basic account data. So distribution lists, not part of the equation when it comes to the sync, and that is by design. We don't want them to connect. Um, currently our neon list is curated better than our constant contact list. Kudos, that's typically the opposite. Um, so <laughs> that's kind of cool. Um, our changes made in, uh, how does this work now? Will updates to neon lists automatically update in constant contact? Um, a, a real time sync is is something that um, in all honesty, I have to reference in terms of how, how often we're doing the updates. I, I think it's in the guide. So if somebody from the neon team can, can pop over the, the support guide, it's gonna talk about the syncing capabilities there. Uh, there's a few questions about the syncing capabilities and I'd rather have us reference the support guide than me trying to remember something. But the reality is, is that um, we want this to be as seamless and, and consistent as possible without also giving uh, performance issues because if it, this, this things were consistently updating every single time you added one account, there's also data hygiene issues in case you wanted somebody to opt out or if you wanted somebody to uh, be added and maybe you're doing a few batch entry of donations and then you know there was some other items there. There's a lot that's happening when it comes to Neon where something is consistently happening every 15 seconds in terms of updates, that's not how we do it. And that's not how pretty much any system does it, even if they do auto syncing. So uh, it's going to be on a timed basis. And so uh, the support guide is, is something that uh, our team member just linked to. Definitely check that out uh, uh, when it comes to getting the technical details of a lot of these items. But pretty much no system's gonna be doing it literally live, unless it's like adding one thing individually like Zapier you know, which is not going to be doing a lot of detailed, you know, specialized data for list segmentation, like what we're doing and what Constant Contact is doing. Um, so that's how I would answer a lot of those answers uh, when it comes to the auto syncing. Uh, do, can Constant Contact do sequential emails to a list? Um, uh, basically, that's like a drip campaign to a list, uh, Matt. Repeat the question, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so this is a thing that Neon uh, can do, but if you wanted to set up like a drip campaign against mm -hmm. a list, um, like I want somebody to receive something on this date, then five days later, this thing, does it have that schedule? Yeah, we do actually. That's right. um, so there's actually two different ways you could do it. You could do it very manually, which is just create multiple emails and have it, you know, manually go in and, and go out five days later, five days later. But we actually also have a feature that will give you the ability to completely automate it. So as soon as you import the list, they get email one on this date, they get email two on this date, you know, and it could be days, weeks, hours. Um, you can completely automate that um, and you can even take it a step further as I kind of teased earlier and you could even have it based on link behavior so um, what I just described to you is list behavior but you can even automate it so that if somebody clicks on a particular link they can then get a one-off email or even a drip campaign all right um... and I'll go ahead and throw in one last thing because I believe in, in uh, transparency so some of the functionality I just described to you requires, so Constant Contact has, uh, ideally some of you are starting to explore, has two different offerings of service, our basic package and Email Plus. Email Plus has some more robust marketing tools. Um, some of the automation I just described to you does require Email Plus. I didn't want to uh, bait and switch anybody there. No, and, and, and on the opposite side, I would also say that some of the sequential items uh, could potentially be handled by Neon as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so definitely check out functionality as it relates to sequential email, search the support center for that, as well as workflows. 
uh, workflows is an exciting new feature that uh, uh, anybody on here should should be checking out and this is something that can also help populate like lists that you might want to send over to the constant contact for instance to help build the queries and and queue people up that when you're building that uh, maybe updating account custom fields uh, individual types that you would send over to constant contact through the sync workflows can help with that type of stuff uh, full transparency. We even did scope out the potential of adding people directly to constant contact lists through workflows. We just had to scale that back because we wanted to get the thing out first. So if that's something that you want, put it in the comments. Ask us. We're going to listen. We're going to look into the technical reasons as to why uh, we would want to, uh, you know, roll that out. That's something that we take very seriously. But workflows might answer, answer some of the sequential email stuff. Um, do you think it would be, Matt, this is for you, do you think it would be Thank worthwhile you. to email? Uh, yes, I'm going to start stating that <laughs> more often. Uh, do you, stream of consciousness, man, here, it's like, no, I know, so, I get it. Uh, do you think it would be worthwhile to email folks who have opted out and ask them if they only want to receive the newsletter and no solicitations? Mm. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Well, there's a couple of different approaches to that. First of me, I'll start really high level. No, you don't particularly want to do that. Um, you know, from a federal law standpoint, um, if somebody unsubscribes, you can, and I want to be crystal clear, make sure everybody's paying attention because I don't want you to half hear me here. You can reach out to them outside of a bulk email marketing tool. So you them, you, know, uh, you could call them. Um, odds are, you know, very few cases, uh, unsubscribes are very intentional. Now, I do know, and everybody listening in, I'm sure you have some member or subscriber who's unsubscribed um, and were just uh, confused. They want to come back. That occasionally happens. Um, but odds are they unsubscribe with a purpose. Um, and if you're using a tool like Constant Contact, we actually pull them and we say, do you want to remove yourself from all lists? Here's the available lists um, that you have been on. Um, and so we do give them the option to unsubscribe from various kinds of marketing you're doing. Um, but in general, uh, you really don't want to make a practice of reaching out to unsubscribes um, because then it can increase the chance of them complaining. Um, and there's a you know growing number of ways that they can complain. Um, uh, do know, though, that Constant Contact makes it easy for you to have them resubscribe. So if somebody does call, says, I want to resubscribe, you can actually send them a really quick email through Constant Contact. They can confirm that they want to resubscribe and you can have them back. And remember, the base setting for the resubscribe is is for us to bring it back in. Mm -hmm. So so keep that in mind when it comes to the sync. It's actually going to be able to engage that because unsubscribes uh, uh, and and other items are things that are are going to be working in an auto way. By the way, um, so okay, you okay so. I think this is going to be one for you again, Matt. Mm -hmm. You mentioned less is more. Shorter, simpler emails to a specific group is better than a monthly newsletter. What if you have a group of members who want to communicate multiple stories uh, to? Mm -hmm. What if you have a group of members who you want to communicate multiple stories to throughout a month? Is there a risk that they would unsubscribe if I start sending them a bunch of emails so let's talk about a couple of things there because there's a couple of layers to unpack mm -hmm. firstly um, one thing to be conscious of is um, most people really complain about getting too many emails it's not that people really dislike too many emails they dislike emails that are not pertinent and relevant um, you know uh, the example I always share that always gets a chuckle when I'm in front of an audience is you know there is an organization I open up every email from and I get three emails a day and that's my stockbroker. Why do I open that email? Because it's pertinent, it's relevant to me, extremely pertinent and relevant to me. Um, and so while we who run uh, uh, nonprofits obviously have the passion and we think, why wouldn't everybody in the world want to know this? You got to be really sure that that content is really going to be pertinent to them. Now, going back to the original question of, is it better to send them just one with everything? This, this is something you definitely want to try out. Like it's something you could test is send part of that group um, the same kind of email with all the stuff in it and send part of the e group a very stripped down email and see if you get a higher click through rate, see if you get more registrants, see if you get more donations from the simple one or the complex one um, and do several tests like that so that you don't just rely on one particular email uh, to prove out the test. You might be right. 
we might be right. The best practice might be right. Your organization might be right. You're never going to know unless you test some assumptions. But what I can share is that through the millions of email constant contact sends out a day, through the billions we send out in December, our data proves that less is less is more. Less gets higher click-through rates. Let that complicated content live on your website. Instead of sharing three events you have coming up or 10 events you have coming up, share the most pertinent upcoming event and then drive them to the event page where they can find out more. Um, uh, that kind of strategy is probably going to equal more success. And and two resources that I can point to specific to the nonprofit sector as well when it comes to this. I had the absolute pleasure of seeing Tom Ahern speak in person who's like the pro at, at newsletters and stuff like that. And uh, and so when it comes to those types of things, Tom Ahern is great to check out. He has a few books. He definitely has blogs that you can read. Sign up for his newsletter too. Uh, it's going to be good. <laughs> um, and, and he generally uh, does think that sending uh, content that's specific to your members or your donors is a good thing no matter what. Um, and then combine with Matt's recommendations, I think you're going to see some excellent stuff. Another excellent firm uh, that we work with from an educational standpoint uh, is Next After. We actually did a, a webinar with them that besides this, I love email stuff overall. It's some of my favorite um, webinars to do. And they, they, we did a fantastic webinar with them too. So check out uh, about email deliver, deliverability, deliverability um, if I could say that right. And uh, their stuff next after uh, is really, really cool when it comes to like, like super detailed testing. Like Matt, I have you heard of them? Mm -mm. You gotta check them out. I think you'd love them. They like the things that they do, you just like, you would go, I, how do they have time for this? They sign up, they signed up for instance, for 400 different nonprofit newsletters and analyze them. And they just like sit there and see like and analyze trends and then then like look at the data around that type of stuff. It's awesome. Um, really, really cool stuff. So those are two free resources to definitely check out. I'll go ahead and throw one more out since I'm a company man. We, you know, I didn't share every tip in the world with you today uh, for time, but we have a free resource uh, blogs.constantcontact.com where about, you know, every every other email, uh, every other blog article is about nonprofits. That's half of our business is nonprofits. Um, but, uh, you know, going into the testing, testing can also be as simple as strategically deciding what links you're going to put in or sometimes really purposely putting links in your email to ask your audience something specific. It doesn't always have to be a link back to the, the, the donation or a link to, to your to your news page. You can literally have a series of button links in your email that say, we want to learn more about you. Click if you are, you know, click your gender or click your preference for our future content. And literally because they click on that, um, you now know more about them. And if you're using constant contact, you can put them into a list. You can auto segment them just because they chose what kind of information they want to get from you by clicking on a link. Absolutely. And even use that to inform, like use donor surveys uh, as well. That's a big hot thing in the industry is asking donors how they want to be communicated with and use that to leverage. Absolutely. As well, um, final question that we have and, and uh, Matt, I, I think both of us could probably throw an answer out. I'm going to start with you. Any mm -hmm. suggestions on how to update emails in terms of deliverables? Like if you get like a hard bounce or somebody's old email or something like that, how do you source a person's? Um, unfortunately, if there's no like labor simple way to do it, it's going to require elbow grease for the most part. I mean, you know, one thing you can do with a, with a bounce, uh, the first low hanging fruit thing to do is just look at it. Um, often a bounce is, it can be obvious, like a dot dot C O M or C O L M, especially if you have people signing themselves up for something, um, or, you know, hotmail with two T's, um, that, that can be a quick low hanging fruit thing to look for. Another thing you can look for is if you know, um, particular subscriber, uh, behavior, if you know a business has gone out of town in your town uh, and you're seeing email addresses from that, I think that's kind of a low-hanging fruit thing you could probably eliminate. Outside of that, you're going to have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you know, certainly reach out to a person. If you know that that's a valuable donor or even a board member or something like that, reach out 
and see they have another email address for some reason that email's bouncing. Often emails bounce from particular categories of organizations. So you'll see a lot of bounces around government, quasi-governmental agencies. You'll see bounces around education and you'll see bounces around um, uh, um, edu uh, hospitals and, and medical organizations. Um, they typically have very hard uh, uh, email rules. Um, and so you might also notice those kind of patterns. And then you basically just have to reach out to the person to get a secondary email address. Yeah, and, and the only other thing that I can think of is there are some services um, that, that claim that they can do kind of like batch searching updates. Those are you know, buyer beware on those types of things. It's not like an NCOA update, which is national change of address, where there's like a dedicated mm -hmm. USPS postal service database of, of like, this is definitely the, the address. With email, you know, even Melissa Data, our data services partner offers that type of thing, but, you know, do a test case and see how effective that is if you're gonna go down that route. Um, otherwise, definitely listen to Matt. Yeah, and I mean, I think the thing I'm warning you about those kind of services is they're probably going to go in and look for the same kind of categories I just told you. They'll also look for businesses that have been listed as out of business. And these are the things that are certainly paying for. I mean, if you have the money, great, um, but uh, it's certainly something you can do yourself. Awesome. All right. Uh, what is the oh uh, next after? Next after is the firm. Uh, next after. I'll pull that up real quick terms of them. Um, all right, send that out to everyone. And then uh, one final question. We'll do one final question for time. I know some people have to go, um, but uh, we are recording this. Uh, how should I start collecting and tracking data? What would you say is the first step? I think this is a, it's almost like the end is the beginning, right? Like let's end on that question in terms of how can you start properly collecting and tracking this data? What do you think is the first step, Matt? Um, as far as, maybe you can help me clarify, Tim. So they're looking at what kind of data they would look for in their email. Is that what you think the, the core of the question is? Honestly, that's what the question is, is just starting collecting. Okay. How do so you if you've done email marketing in the past, start with whatever data you've collected in the past, whether that's in constant contact or not. Um, you know, even if you're not applying a strategy to this, you've probably have a couple pieces of data. One piece of data you have is that these people open your email. If they open your email, you know that they're probably more engaged than uh, somebody that didn't. So we can automatically categorize them as more likely to be engaged. Gauge. Um, you can also take a look at what links you've utilized in the past. So if you go back into whatever tool you're using, Constant Contact or whatever, and you have multiple links in that email, think about what those links were about and start breaking that up into smaller groups. So if, let's say you had um, in an email, you had an upcoming event, you had a donation uh, match, and you had something about a staffer. Well, we now know that people that clicked on each one of those kind of links fall into different kind of categories. So start with the data you already have and start making decisions based on that data. Then moving forward, start to apply a strategy uh, uh, into your future emails of like, okay, I want to send this email to this specific group, but I also want to learn more about what makes them tick. So I'm going to pay attention by putting in a link about this and putting in a link about this and see what interests them the most and just slowly take steps like that email after email after email. And you know what I also think is cool? I happen to bring it up. We have it on the screen here. If you go to that neon.constantcontact.com link, there's an email list builder app that Constant Contact's put together for oh, offline great. and online. Like, check that out. Download it for free. That's going to be something that is going to help you build stuff. Right, for uh, nonprofits, um, you know, it's really great because if you do any kind of event, um, you can actually have that tablet out there have them type in that information. It's automatically synced to Constant Contact. And even if you don't have Wi-Fi, it'll save it until you do have Wi-Fi and it'll sync. Another great tool that Constant Contact provides for free is something called Text to Join, which is basically a texting phone number and a keyword that your organization gets to make up. And people could literally text this to that and join your mailing list via text in about 10 seconds after hearing you speak from stage or looking at your business cards or picking up a piece of collateral. Um, it's a great way to get people from the physical world into the digital world in about 10 seconds. I mean, and that's where things are going. The reality is, is that it, there's, there's this term cyber balkanization, right? Where we are becoming 
segmented away from each other uh, mm -hmm. through because of all this technology and all this different stuff and all these these messages like, you know, I can turn on a TV and have 500 different channels and, and like 20 different versions of Guy Fieri yelling at me, right? And the reality is, is that the best connections that people can make are the ones in person, but people are digesting things on their mobile phones more. 70% of, of folks, if not more, are, are, are looking at stuff, right? Well, and you know, I think that kind of dovetail, you know, a nice closure here because it kind of goes back to the whole theory I talked about earlier, which is, you know, these people bring potential value. They've either donated, they've attended, they've, they've volunteered, or they will, uh, hopefully. Um, so every contact matters. And, you know, we pay attention to these segments. And if you group people into smaller groups and you send yep. them information, it's yep. more personal. Yep. And it's that personal interaction that people are craving. Give it to them. Make it as personal as you can. Now, I don't mean in some cases maybe, but I don't mean like literally putting pictures of their kids in the email. That's ridiculous. But make it as much about them as you can and take what the common nonprofit model is and making it all about you. Make it about them. Um, and, 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 uh, you know, we are becoming, uh, disconnected from each other. Um, but we're also expecting messages to be, uh, related to us. I mean, if you think about it, if you've been on Facebook in the last five minutes, uh, well, hopefully I've been on Facebook in the last five minutes. We so hope you were paying attention to our grammar and <laughs> our <you've> <laughs> <laughs> if you've been on social media in the last you know, year, you know that you're being delivered messages that are specifically about you. Um, and we're being trained to pay more attention to things because it's tailored to us. Um, and so segmenting your list, paying attention to your data, organizing your data, utilizing tools to help you organize that data is going to help your organization succeed. And uh, that's what we all want. And the data, the data, and the and the attention to personalization, the it it shows the data is showing us that that leads to more donations. It leads to higher retention rates if you do these things. Well, if so, you think about it, if I got a donation request from some organization that I had only met casually and really didn't have passion about, I might not donate to it. But if I got an email that said Matthew. Uh, we need your donation, and it was an organization, not particularly an organization, but it was a donation request specifically about a campaign that I was passionate about, and they knew I was passionate about it because I clicked on a link about it, you know, a year ago. Um, I'm more likely to pay attention to that because it's speaking to my passion, um, and, and that's really the way you make uh, uh, more donations out of this. Awesome. Awesome. Well, this was a fantastic session, Matt. I've been looking forward to this for, for several weeks, as you know. Um, and, and this was great. This was great. My pleasure. Uh, thanks for having me. I was looking forward to it too. And, you know, those of you, uh, uh that are interested in signing for constant contact, you'll hear my voice again and again, we do, uh, uh, getting started webinars. We take, uh, take you up to the next level, the next level, the next level. So we'll hold your hand all the way through. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely check out neon.constantcontact.com. And also we will be sending things out, uh, for folks, uh, if this is the first time that you're hearing about Neon CRM, welcome. We're a fantastic donor and membership management platform that syncs directly with Constant Contact in a really beautiful way. So um, awesome, awesome. Well, we are going to wish everybody a lovely Wednesday. We're coming up right at when we said we would be ending today. So I want to uh, end it on a high note and thank the Constant Contact team for providing not only a fantastic platform, but wonderful content. And please, folks, make sure to download the handouts that they provided us as well today, too. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tim. Okay, thank you. Have, have a good day. Take care, all.